I've mentioned already in other videos that there are five different types of villages that can generate in Minecraft, depending on the area they are in. What I haven't mentioned is that not only does each village type have its own unique style, but that style also includes the look of the villagers themselves. But did you know there are actually two hidden types of villagers that don't naturally spawn with villages? Or that villagers have a gossip function that is affected by what you do as the player? And if you understand villager mechanics, you could complete a fully enchanted set of diamond gear without ever mining a single diamond? Well, if you already knew all three of these things, then you're probably an experienced player. But if not, stick around and I'll discuss the key things worth knowing about villages in Minecraft. In this video, I'll talk about what you can find in a village, how villagers act and why, what risks there are to villagers, and how you could even potentially start your own village if you choose to. And in part two, we'll dive into villager professions and how to use the game's trading system to give you a leg up on your survival. Bonus question, did you know that the villagers have a group of cranky cousins who are bent on their destruction? Well that will be a future topic to discuss as well. Minecraft is a game with nearly unlimited possibility. It's about as open world as you can get. Explore, fight, gather, create. You can do whatever you choose to set your mind to. But the same things that make Minecraft great may also make it overwhelming, especially for newer players. And that's why this video exists. I can't tell you how to play, but I can help you discover what you can do to get you started, and for some more experienced players, maybe help you brush up on the basics. Welcome to Minecraft Caves Notes. Let's go ahead and mine right into today's topic. Alright, so back in my first Minecraft Day video, I talked about how useful it can be to spawn near a village. Let's start by reviewing that in a bit more detail. In any village, there are four categories of structures that can generate. The obvious first one is houses. These buildings have quite a few varieties, especially when spread across the five village types. But what they all have in common is one to two beds. For the early game, easy access to a bed can be a godsend, as you can choose to sleep in it or borrow it to take with you. The other buildings in the village are workplaces, and they will not have beds in them but instead have one or more specific blocks known as villager workstations, or job blocks. We'll go into further details on villager professions in the next video. The farmer villager is a notable exception here, as their workstation is not in a building, but on a field of crops. These farms are workplaces, but also bleed into the next structure category, which is decorative structures. This group is a bit varied, with everything from groups of hay bales to sandstone pillars, wool-covered pavilions, cobblestone gathering places, and even piles of ice or snow. The most important thing to point out here is that one variety of decorative structure, called the town center or meeting point, will always generate with the village, and only one. This area has several different forms, but will always house the town bell which is an interactable block that has a specific function when the village is under assault. Lastly are the animal pens. Sometimes these are just small fenced areas, while other times they may even be a stable that generates. Animal pens will generate with one or more farm animals in them, which includes cows, pigs, sheep, chickens, and horses. With the exception of the town meeting point, which always generates exactly once in a village, all other structures may or may not e exist, or even be duplicated, creating a unique village layout every single time. Certain buildings in both the house and workplace categories may also contain chests. The type of loot possible in the chest depends on the specific blueprint that generates it. In general, house chests will randomly contain seeds, crops or bread, local plants like flowers or grass, and possibly even emeralds. Workplace chests use loot tables related to the profession tied to the building. For example, the cartographer has a chest, except in desert villages, that can contain paper, compasses, or blank maps, while the leather worker chest can have leather or even leather armor, except also not in desert villages. The most prized village chest for most players is the weapon smith chest. As in all village types, the chest generated may contain iron, iron armor, weapons or tools, gold, and maybe even diamonds or obsidian. 
Chest loot will vary some depending on the village type. For example, the Savannah Fisher's Hut is the only village chest that might have a bucket, while Snowy Plains village chests can have snow and coal in them. All villagers will attempt to claim a bed. The total population of a village is normally capped by the number of available beds in the village, unless specifically manipulated by the player. At night, all villagers will attempt to pathfind to their claimed bed and sleep. Adult villagers will also attempt to claim a workstation if they do not already have a profession. There is one exception. Some villagers are born nitwits and refuse to work. They can be identified by their green robes. Unemployed villagers will spend part of their day seeking workstations, while children will run around quickly playing tag and finding beds to jump on. All villagers have a daily schedule, which consists of sleeping, wandering, working, and socializing, depending on the time of day. Nitwits ignore the working portion, and children will only play or wander. Working consists of a villager spending time at their workstation, and if they had been traded with already, restocking their goods. The exception here is the farmer. Farmers don't just sit at their workstation, but instead physically collect crops and replant them, depositing the leftovers at their composter. Additionally, in bedrock, librarians may go and inspect bookshelves instead of just spending the day at their lectern. Socializing occurs primarily around the town center, and this is when gossip exchange happens. The gossip function creates a hidden value for the player in each village and is essentially a reputation value. A good reputation will mean discounts on trade prices, and if you are able to save the village from a raid, you may even receive free gifts thrown to you by the employed villagers. A poor reputation means higher prices, and if it gets bad enough, could cause the iron golems to turn on you. Speaking of iron golems, they exist to protect the villagers. Iron golems can be manually created, but will also naturally spawn based on conditions in a village. My bonus question earlier about the villager's angry cousins? They are known as the Illagers, and will attack villagers on sight. And they're pretty brutal. The children will not be spared. Additionally, while most mobs ignore villagers, all zombie variants will also seek out villagers if they are not already focused on the player. This is one area where the difficulty setting changes gameplay. On hard mode, villagers killed by zombies will become zombie villagers. On normal mode, villagers have a 50% chance to turn into zombie villagers, and on easy, they will never turn. Ironically, this creates some incentive for harder difficulty, as zombie villagers may be cured with a special method if they can be kept alive. But on easy mode, they're gone for good when defeated. A cured villager also has a personal boost to player relationship and will drastically lower trade prices for you for a while. Ultimately, what this means is that settling down in a village is normally not recommended, unless you already have the resources to stop monster spawning and create at least basic defenses. However, you can absolutely build near a village so you can easily visit when you need to. Check out Chapter 8 for mob spawning conditions. And note that the only 100% safe distance in most cases is 128 blocks away. You could use coordinates to figure out how far away you need to be, but as a general rule of thumb, as long as you haven't changed your render distance settings from the defaults, having the village just at the edge of your visible horizon on Java, or in the farther half of what you can see on Bedrock, will work just fine. Iron golems themselves spawn when certain conditions are met, which are slightly different depending on the version, but at least one will always spawn with a village. When an iron golem is killed, it drops three to five iron ingots. Exploiting this mechanic by separating out a few villagers, spawn-proofing a proper area around them, and then having them be frequently scared by an enemy is how players build automatic iron farms to collect drops from iron golems. Although I'll talk about them more in depth in another video, I also want to note that iron golems aren't the only mob that villages spawn. When the village has at least four beds, cats will also randomly spawn, and in fact, villages are the only place to naturally find them. Okay, so I mentioned at the very beginning that there are two hidden villager types. Well, although villages only spawn as plains, taiga, savanna, desert, and snowy types, the jungle and the swamp each have their own villager skins. But, to see them, 
you'll usually need to create your own village in these biomes. And while I'm never one to advocate committing a crime like kidnapping, to do this, you will pretty much need to kidnap a couple villagers and allow them to populate your new area. Or, as mentioned before, you can cure zombie villagers. And zombie villagers may spawn on their own, as opposed to just the ones turned by zombie attacks. So it is possible to get villagers without taking any of them away from their homes. Curing a zombie villager is simple in theory, but not always in execution. To do so, the zombie villager must be under the weakness effect, usually by the player throwing a potion at it, and then you would feed it a golden apple. Click the use button on the mob while holding one. We haven't covered potions in the series yet, but there is an easy way to do this if you have snowy biomes nearby. 50% of igloos generate with a basement. The basement is actually a hint at villager curing, as it always contains a villager, a zombie villager, a brewing stand with a splash potion of weakness in it, and a chest that has a golden apple. And because the zombie villager is trapped, breaking a single block in front of it will allow you to splash it with the potion and feed it the apple quite safely. Once a zombie villager begins its curing process, it will make a loud sound and shake for five minutes. Be careful, it is still completely hostile during this time. And of course, the hardest part of the curing process without an igloo is isolating the zombie villager from other mobs and then trapping it to keep you safe and keep it from burning in the morning sun. Back to the swamp and jungle villagers. While they aren't meant to spawn naturally, there is a rarer but possible third method to spawning them. Some villages may generate on the border of biomes or nearby. If you are lucky enough to find a village that is within a few dozen blocks of a swamp or a jungle, you may be able to extend the village into the target biome. Child villages take on the look of the biome they are born in, but in Java Edition there is also a 50% chance to instead inherit their style from one of their parents. Unlike many of us in the real world, villagers will not have children until they have the proper space for them in the village. Primarily this means unclaimed beds. However, they must also have a sufficient stock of food in order for the stork to visit. The way this works is that each villager, even the children and nitwits, have eight hidden inventory slots. You can't interact with a villager's inventory, but they can and will pick up certain items and keep them. For most villagers, these items are bread, wheat, and wheat seeds, carrots, potatoes, beetroot, and beetroot seeds. Farmers may also pick up torch flower seeds, pitcher pods, and bone meal. Villagers may also share food with others who have less by dropping items for their neighbor to pick up. This helps to balance out the inventories of villagers. For breeding to occur, not only must a bed be available, but two villagers must both have at least 12 carrots, potatoes, or beetroot, or three bread in their inventory. If these conditions are met, then during social time you may catch a glimpse of some hearts over a pair of villagers, and a moment later, a half-pint new member will appear next to one of them. Like many other mechanics, players have also discovered how to manipulate conditions so that the two parents are constantly detecting an empty bed and have enough food to continue the cycle, whisking away the children to a local orphanage until they are old enough to join the workforce. Yes, I know, Minecraft players are almost as terrible as Sims players. Breeding has a cooldown of 5 minutes on Java Edition, and in both editions children take 20 minutes of real life time to grow up. There is also a small chance for a village to generate as an abandoned village. All villagers will be zombie villagers, and cobwebs will replace much of the generated structures. These are mostly a novelty, but if you do feel like taking the time and effort to cure the villagers, you could bring the village back from the brink yourself. So as you can probably see, there's a lot going on behind the scenes in a village. So much so that I left the best part for the next video. Next time, we'll talk about each of the villager professions, how trading works, and what trades to look out for. I hope you enjoyed today's Caves Notes, and if you did, please drop a like, stick around, and consider subscribing, because there's still so much more to come. As always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you soon.